It's a brand new day. Let's teach your way. It's time for music play. Welcome back to the Music Play Minutes podcast. This episode is also available as a webinar with a handout and a PD certificate. All extra resources, including visual examples mentioned in this episode, can be found at workshops.musicplay.ca. Are you a music educator looking to create an engaging and dynamic classroom environment? Look no further. This webinar, presented by Stacy Werner, will equip you with the knowledge and tools to implement effective music centers, catering to diverse learning styles, and fostering a fun student-led exploration of music. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Stacy Werner, and I'm going to talk to you today about music centers in the elementary music classroom. Um, and just a little bit about me first. I'm a practicing music teacher. I just came home from a full day of work as well. I teach kindergarten to grade six music uh, just east of Calgary, Alberta, in a small city called Chestermere. We're a nice little lake community. Um, I've been teaching at my current school for nine years, and I've been teaching for a total of 12 years. And I'm also the author of Super Simple Music Centers uh, for kindergarten grade uh, one. And then there's the second book for grades two and grade three. Um, So I'm going to show you today uh, about our music centers. Um, So we'll start off today with why centers are important in the music room. All right. So... Uh, centers are so wonderful in the music room to give students the opportunity to have some play-based learning. It can be some student-directed learning as well. It encourages students to work in groups, collaboration, responsibility, problem solving, gives you some opportunities to differentiate and meet the different learning needs of your different learners in your classroom. It gives you a chance to act as a facilitator in the classroom. I enjoy it sometimes because as music teachers, we're often up at the front of the classroom and leading a lesson. And it's just sometimes nice to sit back and watch the kids for a lesson as well. And you can also use this time to assess students one-on-one. And we'll get onto more more about that a little bit later. And then uh, centers are hands-on. They're engaging and they're fun. And I know that there's a big push in my school right now to use less worksheets um, and have more play-based learning and have the students learning from through games. And I use very little worksheets in my classroom. Very rarely will I even go to the photocopier to photocopy worksheets because we do more games and centers and give students those opportunities. Um, so then just some ideas to get started for your music room, because your music room is very different than mine, potentially. Um, so just some things to consider. What grade levels are you planning for? How much time do you have? Uh, for myself, I only have two 35-minute blocks per week. Um, and then how many students do you have in each class? Because that will kind of help you decide how many centers you should have at one time. What types of workspaces do you have available? Do you have tables in your classroom? Are your students working on risers? Are they working on uh, the floor? Uh, Do you have clipboards if they're working on the floor? And then how can you do centers while teaching multiple grade levels each day? Uh, So some things to consider that kind of leads into your schedule and your timetable. You know, if you're teaching grade ones and then next you have grade fives. How are you going to make that work throughout your day? Um, And then what concepts do you want your students to work on? So is there something currently that you need to assess that you want to spend some time on? And then how can you differentiate centers to meet all the learning needs? So you might have some students that are more advanced. Maybe they could do a more challenging game together um, or students that you need to work with a little more one-on-one and maybe put them together. And then how can I prepare centers fast? Um, Centers can seem quite intimidating at first because it can be a lot of work to get it going. Um, So I'm going to show you just some really easy centers today that shouldn't be minimal prep so that you can get going very quickly with your centers. Uh, So then organization and management. This is what what has worked best for me. And uh, of course, adapt according to your situation. Uh, I like to select four to six centers depending on my class size. I allow five to 10 minutes per center. And you may need multiple class periods for every student to get to every center. I generally watch the students. And when they start to get a little bit like, oh, I'm done, I'm done. And then we'll start to move on to the next center. I like to create my groups myself because then I know the students and I know who they work best with. 
I like to have defined spaces. So we'll kind of space out the classroom, like one area will be a table where they work. Um, I might bring a few desks in, I'll have bins. And sometimes I put hula hoops around those bins so that students can see a more defined area for that center. Um, and sometimes I will put even signs out for the center so that they can see what the different centers are. Uh, it's good to separate quiet and noisy activities. So if you're doing a listening center, keep that away from playing instruments. Um, another key thing is to not really introduce too much new material. It should mostly be review material because if you're doing too many new things, the students will get overwhelmed. Uh, I like to use a signal to move to the next center. I will sometimes just turn the lights off and then they know to go to the next center um, or whatever you use in your classroom to get your students attention. Uh, consider leaving one empty center for students to finish early. Uh, leave extra time for cleanup at the end. And then I, when I'm doing assessment with centers, I only like to do one center at a time for assessment so that I know the other kids are playing, they're working independently. And then I have the other group that I can work with and do an assessment with. All right, so before the first day, I like to go through and demonstrate every center. To make this move faster, select a few centers that students have used before as whole class games or activities. So I'm going to show you some of the activities uh, shortly here that I've used before just with a whole class so that when we're doing it as a center, I just have to say, oh, we're going to play this game at this center and they know what to do. And then if there's a few new things, I can spend some time on explaining that. Um, place the students in groups of three to six. So your choice, you can do that before. Um, I often now will just keep those my center group cards with me and I'll write the names down really quick or sometimes I even hand them to a small group of students that I've just grouped together right in the classroom. They write their names on them and then they hand their card into me and then I tell them which center to go to first. Um, and then uh, assign the groups to a center and fill out your tracking sheet. And make sure to um, uh, assign the groups to center and fill out the center tracking sheet and make sure to keep track of this because I teach 22 different classes per week. If I don't keep track of where each group went, I will not remember the next time they come through the door. So I use that center tracking sheet to make sure I know where everybody has been. And then keep the center group cards and tracking sheets together for your next class. So that just makes it easy to keep things organized and structured. Okay, so I'm going to start today with some DIY centers. Um, so in this section, I'm going to share with you some centers that have been successful that I've made with purchase craft supplies or additional materials. The students have enjoyed these centers, but there's a bit of a higher financial cost getting started and some additional preparation time in getting started with these centers. So the first one has been a real favorite in my classroom, and this is Lego instrument building. So we're just going to share a short video with you. And this is just to kind of help the kids get some ideas about building their own instruments. Are these filled with Legos? They are. That is yeah. so cool. Do you want to record talking, some like woo, single okay. hits on this that we can use to remix? All right. mm. Your breaks are breaks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ah. oh. That's yeah. a great sound. Yeah, dude, you guys, that was so good. That was so fun. Yeah. Are we a band? So we collected tons of sounds with these awesome creators. Here's the track we made. I like this so far. Worth it. <laughs> Is that good? So good. Teamwork. 
watch our VidCon video or right here for our first Lego song. Okay. So uh, that was just kind of an introduction that I gave to my students for this, um, for this center. And I actually would have shown the video previous class. So I wouldn't have used my center class time for that. Uh, and then do you just encourage, oh, sorry, the second video there. Uh, we don't have to watch that one because it's quite long. It's about 15 minutes long, but it's a fantastic video created by the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra that talks about percussion instruments. Um, so that's where I like to go with the Lego instruments is that I encourage them to come up with something they can hit, shake, or scrape, or maybe their instrument can do all three of those things. Um, and they really enjoy making the instruments. Uh, but again, this is a little bit more expensive to put together. Um, there's maybe a chance maybe you could get some Lego donated to your classroom. Uh, I also encourage you to get more of the basic brick pieces so that they have time to build something fast rather than the technical pieces. Uh, and then just on the next slide, there's just some examples of some things that my students have made and just kind of where I keep the bin. Uh, and then another thing is that I got to that um, Ikea sells these Lego boxes. And I had some of those that I bought for my kids and I just took them from home and I brought them to school for a couple days. And those were really nice because the kids could really build things quick and come up with some sort of shaker or, or a drum that they could use. Okay, the next game is a favorite of my students. It's called Busted. And what you need for this game is some large popsicle sticks. I've also done it with Duplo Lego blocks as well. And then you just need some tall, round plastic containers. So I use old tennis ball containers. So if you have some Bobos in your classroom, you can reuse your Bobo containers to make some Busted games. Um, so what the students do, so this one here is my grade, I think grade one or two level one. Um, so inside, I just have some large popsicle sticks and I've written various rhythms down based on the level of my students. And all they do is they close their eyes, they sit in a circle, they close their eyes and one student takes out a stick and they put it down in front of them and they stay and clap that rhythm. So I picked up a taw, I'm gonna stay and clap. Then the next student goes, they pull a stick out of the container. Oh, they got a rest. And then they would stay and clap for the rest. And then you continue going around the circle until someone pulls out a stick that says busted. And if they get the stick that says busted, they have to take all their sticks that are in their pile and put them back into the container. And this is just a really simple, quick game to just practice what are the names of those notes again and to get that into the students um, for review. Um, if you're doing with Lego blocks, so I just have a bag here of Duplo blocks and I actually got these. There was a teacher getting rid of these at my school and I went and grabbed them all and had a whole, I've got four or five bags of Duplo blocks all this size of the square. And so I have them build the tower instead. And so they might have four or five on their tower. And then they get a busted. And I just drew on with Sharpie marker all the different rhythms. And then say they get their busted. Oh, then they have to take their whole tower apart and put it back into the bag. And I'll sometimes put these into a, a bin instead. So it's a little bit easier for them to close their eyes and dig into those bins. Um, and then I've made them for various grade levels. So for grade one, I would just do ta, tt, rest, and the busted stick. Um, for grade threes, I go up to ticka, ticka. Um, and I found these bigger uh, containers for my grade threes. Uh, and then for my grade fours, I started doing ones with note names as well. So what we would do for this one I just found these again in my classroom too. The old previous teacher had had these already done. Um, and there's some notes here. And then on the other side, there is just the note name. And so I put the side down where they can't see what the note name is. And they just lay them out on the floor in front of them. And then if they, I just wrote it busted on a few of the answers on the back. Sorry if we can't see that. And oh, there's the busted. 
And then if they got that, they'd have to put all their cards back. So again, just a really quick, easy review game um, that we've continued going through various grade levels and they just know how to play it. And then it's super easy when we do centers. That's one that I almost do every single time because it's just a quick, easy one and they know how to do it and I don't have to explain a lot. And I've made enough of these that my whole class can also play the game at one time. And really good if you have like five minutes at the end of class or something, you just need something quick to do with the kids as well. Okay, so that's busted. And then we have uh, singing puppets. So for this one, I was just kind of thinking about how to incorporate more singing into my centers. And so what you need for this is you need some puppets. I was able to find some really inexpensive puppets at the dollar store and then have a small black table with a tablecloth for your puppet stage. Uh, just start with students first, work together, just having conversations. So you could even do this as a whole class first, bring a puppet around the room, tell the puppet what your favorite food is and hold the puppet and uh, ask a student, what's your favorite food? And maybe the puppet, we can explain to them, the puppet only understands singing language. So you have to sing it back to them. And they'd sing that back to the puppet and then practice that before you do this as a center. And it also helps to do those singing conversations and improvising with their voice and learning how to use their voice at a young age. Um, and then once they get those singing conversations down, have tried the, try that with the puppets in the singing conversation, then encourage them to try setting up the puppet stage and making up their own little singing puppet show and just have some fun with it. Uh, one thing to watch for is sometimes they turn their singing voice into animal voices instead. So just give them that reminder to continue using their singing voices. Um, yeah, so that one's a fun one. Another one that was just really easy and quick to set up is just keyboards. Uh, and just sometimes the kids, they just want to play and let them explore on the keyboards. So I was lucky enough that I had a few keyboards were donated to my school from parents. So I had a few extras and I just plugged them in, set them up. And then just when the kids were there, I just asked them some guiding questions. Which side is high? Which is low? Can you play on just the black keys or the white keys? Do you see any patterns on the keyboard? And it's just fun. They just want to try. Some of the kids don't get that opportunity to play on a keyboard very often. I also thought a floor piano would be really fun to try sometimes. So hopefully one day I can try that with my students as well. Um, so we're going to get into some of the centers from the Super center, super Simple Centers kit. So what's great about this kit is everything's ready to go for you. All you have to do is print. If you want to laminate, you can laminate. You can also just put them into some sheet protectors. Uh, and then some centers have some cutting, but I tried to make it so that you literally just have to do one cut, two cuts, and <laughs> it's ready to go. Um, so try to make it as easy as possible for you so that you can get those centers ready to go quick. So I wanted to share with you some of my favorite ones. So the first one is Animal Snap. And this is a great one as well for our beginner readers and starting to read and understand syllables in the world, in the words. Um, so there's two levels for this. So you can, this would work well for kindergarten potentially, and then going into grade one, um, depending on the reading levels of your students. And so there's two different levels of cards. The first one, the kids will just identify how many sounds there are. So they pick a card out of the stack. And then I like to use, I just got at the dollar store some laundry clips, but you could also just use paper clips for this as well. And so then what they do is they look at the word or the picture and they say and clap what they see. So we'd say clap chicken. And then they put it beside one sound or two sounds. And then it also comes with two cheat sheets so they can check their answers. And here's level one cheat sheet and level two. Oh yeah, and that's all there as well. And they can check their answers. And then if they get correct, they get to keep the card. And then the student at the end with the most cards wins. Sometimes I don't encourage that either. We just stop when it's time to stop and we don't worry about counting up the cards. Sometimes that can lead to some management issues there as well, depending on what your group is. And then another very easy one to do with the littles is Beat Keeper. So for this one, you'll line up, uh, you could use eight beats or 16 beats. I would start with eight beats the first time you do this center. 
and you lay them out on the floor and then turn, ask a student to, or turn one card over. And then they just try playing the beat and they can say the numbers out loud as well. So they'd say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then if card number three is turned over, they don't say three. One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they can explore doing this with instruments as well. So leave a small bin of non-pitch percussion instruments and they can play along and practice turning over different beats. And you could have one student be in charge as well as being the conductor. And they point to the beats while the other students play, watching for that beat that is turned over. And that would be one too I would do as a whole class game first and then put into a center. Okay, and our next one is loud and quiet. This is just a very simple, easy sorting center. Um, so the kids will go through the cards and sort into loud or quiet. And then it also gives you an option at the end to create with loud or quiet. So they pick eight of the cards, put them on top of those beats that you see, and then they would try playing their song. So they could have loud, quiet, loud, Quiet, loud, 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 quiet. And they can try it with instruments as well or just use body percussion for that. Uh, squishy music. This one is a favorite in my classroom. The kids love to play with Play-Doh. And these are just some cards and just gives them an opportunity to have some exposure to some different music symbols. Even if they are in kindergarten, it's good for them to see these symbols. And I also, um, maybe if you're not comfortable using Play-Doh, uh, my school started doing lots of things with loose parts recently. And so there's a whole bunch of loose parts bins that I can just go and grab. Um, and the students could also just try making the symbols on the cards using loose parts as well. So that's something that we tried last year and went over very, very well with my students. Um, and with the Play-Doh, I know sometimes there's some issues with hygiene with that. So I often will buy like just the little um, containers of Play-Doh or sometimes the teachers at my school have Play-Doh already in the kids' desks that is their own Play-Doh and they just bring it with them to class and we just use the Play-Doh that they already have. Uh, so that was pretty self-explanatory. And then uh, fast and slow movement. This gives us opportunity for students to practice some tempo and also gives them an opportunity to create a rhythm to try. Um, so you can choose one of the 11 cards and perform the rhythm with body percussion. Again, the cards are leveled, so they get harder as you go through them. Um, and then the children choose whether to do it fast or slow. And then they choose what type of body percussion that they would like to do with that. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to create their own. So you could use rhythms that you're working on in your classroom. And if you don't want to print off a whole bunch of worksheets for this, I have a bunch of these. They're little plastic sheet protectors. And you could just put this inside, have this right there at the center, the one where they can create their own. And then they just use a whiteboard marker to write in their rhythm. And they can try it out. And then this also works great because they can circle what tempo they want to use, they can circle what body percussion they want to use, and then they can try the pattern. And this would be something too you could do with the whole group or in small groups as well. If you had five or six groups of students and have each group complete one together and perform it for the class. So again, a lot of these can be used in different ways as well. They don't necessarily have to be centers. They can also be whole group activities. Um, and then we have make a melody. So this just um, gives you a whole bunch of templates for uh, making melodies. So depending on what kind of staff you use in your process for teaching, uh, some teachers go from the one line staff to the two line staff to three and then to five. Um, so just depending on what you want to do with your teaching and if you want to do some creating with somis um, and some sulfa. Uh, again, if you want something more tactile for the kids, something else that I've made before. And I'm sure Denise has showed you these as well at some point, but they're cookie sheet boards. And I got these at the dollar store. I also found a whole bunch of round magnets and they all go onto uh, this like this. And then I write an eight on the back so that the students know that there should be eight magnets on here when they're finished. Uh, and they can just use these round magnets as well to make up their melody. And if we go on to the next one, uh, that one's compose a rhythm. 
And again, all the things are there for you to, to make your rhythm. Uh, but uh, if you want to try, again, just making up like a whole class set of things yourself on the other side of these magnet boards, uh, there's an, I have bought a whole bunch of hearts a long time ago and I covered them with um, like book cover plastic here and then made a line like this. And then I, again, would use these magnets to make some different rhythms. But then I also included in this bag a whole bunch of little popsicle sticks that they can use to make some taws, some TTs, and then we just make a Z for the rest. Um, so kind of your, your choice if you want to, you know, take the time to print and laminate all of those things or spend some more money and make something like this as well. But um, so the book has that avail available for you. And then I know I kind of mentioned that I'm not a huge fan of worksheets, but there is a whole bunch of worksheets as well. Um, but what I would do in my own classroom is I would, for these worksheets, I would put them inside some of the plastic sheet protectors, and then you can use them multiple times with multiple groups of kids. And these ones are just really good for quick assessments. Color high, color fast, color what's loud, color what's one sound, color high, and then there's one that's color low, and there's a few more in there as well, and beat and no beat. So just if you want to do a quick assessment of some of those outcomes, those are available for you as well for the little ones. Uh, and then if we're getting to some centers for grades two and three. Um, so again, the same kit includes the PDFs that you can print. Um, you can also purchase uh, printed colored copies that are already made of all of these too. So they're on the card stock. Um, and then all you would need to do is you could use them right away. But if you want to protect them a little bit more, you could laminate them as well. Uh, so we're going to start here with uh, Cosmic Rhythms which for me was kind of a little twist I added to Busted. Uh, so it has a bunch of rhythm cards at different levels. So you can differentiate according to your classes. Uh, but then if the students pull out of the container uh, a rhythm, they'd again stay and clap it. But if they pull out a black, car black hole card, they lose all their cards. If they pick a shooting star card, they take a card from another player. And then if they pick a blast off, they get to take a second card. And then when you stop the time, the player with the most cards wins. So very similar in some ways to Busted, uh, but with a little twist. So a little additional challenge for them as well. And there's longer rhythms in this one too. Okay. And then the Melody Maker Dice. So this one has a few different templates, again, to differentiate according to where your students are at. Um, so the students would roll the melody dice and create a melody. This is great for melody writing templates. Um, so you place, for me, again, I would put some of these templates into some uh, plastic sheet protectors so that the, more than one class could write on them. And then for the dice, there is a template in the book to make a dice, but you could also, um, I just picked these up at the dollar store and there's a whole bunch of just wooden dice here and you could just write the notes that uh, students could use for whatever pentatonic scale maybe you're using for creating uh, the notes. So you could use C, D, E, G, A, and then high C to make out a miss simple C major pentatonic instruments or uh, composition. And then the students could try that out on instruments as well. And then if you're working towards transferring onto the staff, you could move that melody onto the staff um, and keep going in complexity. And in the book, there's more options to do different pentatonic scales, including major and minor scales. Uh, and then I wanted to make a Play-Doh center for the older students because they like to play with Play-Doh still too. And this one was a great one because they get an opportunity to see the whole staff and feel the five lines on the staff and see where the treble clef goes, see how the notes go on top of the lines or in between the lines. And STEM direction, I always get lots of questions about STEM direction when I do this center. Why is that one upside down, Mrs. Warner? Um, so that's another opportunity to explain that to them, that when we go past on the middle line or higher, we put the stems down. Uh, so uh, yeah, just a fun way for them to play and have fun and learn about the musical staff. Uh, we have soundscape creations. So this one is using pictures to create and make sounds. So the children can choose instruments for the different shapes and pictures. Uh, one student could be the conductor as well and point to the different pictures. 
Um, I've also put the, the colored sheets into some plastic protectors as well uh, and had the students write right on it what instrument they want to use for that picture and then have one student be the conductor and point to it and make the music to match the picture. Uh, and then there is a worksheet as well in the book that students can create their own um, and make that at the center and decide on what instruments they want to use for their different pictures to make their own soundscape creations. Uh, yeah, and there's a sample of what that looks like to create their own. All right, and then this is a great listening center. Um, there's even more of these listening glyphs available on Music Play Online that you can use. Um, I chose to just have one for each season. But yes, so there's some different seasons and you can pick those out for uh, certain times of year to use with your students. And then uh, within the book as well, there's the audio that's included. So I've picked already some recordings that work well for each of the listening um, pictures and the worksheets there. And to make that center, I've had, um, I had an old like audio station that one of the teachers had and it had headphones on it that the kids could plug into and just listen. Um, for sanitary reasons now, I wouldn't do that anymore. I would just put them into a quiet space so that they can listen and have um, the coloring available for them. Okay, and then this one is instrument name sort. Uh, so there's different instruments of the orchestra. The students have to say and clap that instrument name. So xylophone, and then they would put it on the appropriate um, rhythm. So that one would go on the card number three. And then they would go through and sort all of the cards. And there's a big stack of cards. So it would take them definitely a few minutes to get that one done. Um, I wanted again to include some solfa in there as well. So this one, there's lots of um, DIY, oper or sorry, um, lots of differentiation opportunities here. So you can kind of pick out which um, solfa names your students are working on and just put those ones into the center for that time. And this one's similar to the animal snap. Uh, the students would go through and look at the pattern and then put a paper clip or a clip beside and then look on the cheat sheet to see if they got it correct. And if they get it correct, they get to keep the card. Then we have a rhythm tracker. This is one of my students' favorites because they love to be the conductor. They love to be the boss and they take turns being the conductor and point to the rhythm while the other students play and um, put some instruments into the bin. Uh, so I just went with maracas sticks, triangles, and then a, a drum or a tambourine type drum you could use there as well. And then there's some trickier ones too, where two instruments would play at a time or uh, mix it up a little bit. And then it increases in difficulty as well. So uh, there's ticket, ticket, up to ticket, tickets in there for our grade three students. And then there's an opportunity to create with that one as well. So you could put those again into the plastic sheet protectors with a whiteboard marker and they could write out their own rhythm and have their and be the conductor of their own rhythm pattern. This one again too, I've done also as a whole class activity in small groups. Um, so it can be used either way as a center or as a small collaborative group activity. Uh, and then I want to show you just some other things available uh, with themes and variations in music play. Um, and one of my favorites is the rhythm dice. I use these a lot with my students, and this is a fantastic resource with lots of great games to review rhythms. Um, so again, if you don't want to use the worksheets, you can just put them in the sheet protectors and use them as, as a center instead. Um, so one of my students' favorites is the, um, if we scroll down here, or here we can go through the table talk one first. So in this game, it's to be the first one to cross everything off your chart and the students would roll the dice and if say they got a top when they roll the dice they could cross off either a quarter note they could cross off the ta they could cross off one beaten four four or they could cross off the word ta and then the first person to get their entire um grid filled is the winner or you could do like more like a bingo where they pick um, a horizontal row or a vertical row. Um, yeah, so that's a fun one to try. And then uh, my students' favorite is they really enjoy the scales and slides game. And 
to make this one move a little faster, sometimes it's fun to take and try it with two dice instead of one. So they move according to the number of beats. So if they rolled a ta, a titi, or a rest, they, they would only move one square. Um, but if you do a chibu, they move two. If you have a dotted half note, they would move three. And then if you have a whole note, they would move four. So sometimes it's fun to give the kids two dice and they have to add the rhythms together and they get through it a little bit quicker. Um, and it's also good math practice for them too. Uh, this one's a little simpler for the little ones. Um, and it's just a track and just same thing. You just roll the dice and you move according to how many beats um, is on the dice. And then we have add them up. Um, so in this one player throws two to four dice and totals the note value. And the first player to reach the target wins. So you can decide what your target's going to be and you add them up as you go down through the rows. And then we have battling note values. In this one, each player throws a dice. The one with the highest note value scores a point. If there's a tie, they duel. And then the players with the most points would win the game. So just very simple games, but very effective in doing lots of rhythm review. And this one gives them a chance to also do some creating. So you just um, shake and then you write on the grid. Each box in the grid is one beat and you fill in the grid and then transfer that onto writing a rhythm on the staff. Um, and so that would be a very good opportunity for students to create and then add instruments to that as well. And then there's one also available in three, four time too. Okay, and then um, if you're interested in centers for students a little bit older, uh, there's also some available for grades three to six. And these come are a lot of games and things as well that you could order off of themes and variations and music play. Uh, I also love to include a technology component to my centers. Uh, again, it's tough. You gotta figure out your school and what your school's doing for technology. For me, it's even different for grade level, what we're doing, like the grade ones and twos have iPads, the grade threes and fours have Chromebooks, the grade fives and sixes have MacBooks. So depending on who's doing the centers, I might put some links into their Google Classroom ahead of time so they can go in and get to those centers. Um, or I've also used QR codes for the kids, for the my students using iPads, and then they just scan those and it links them right to where they need to go. Um, so that's kind of a tough one. You kind of got to figure out how it works in your school. But some of our favorites have been the melody composition games, the rhythm composition, which rhythm do you hear? Match the melody. Which instruments did you hear? Note name memory. Coconut Chaos is definitely the number one. My students love that game. Uh, note Toss, Space Music Adventure. And then they could also play the instrument bingo game uh, in partners and share a device. Um, so all of these are, if you go into Music Play Online and on the left-hand side, if you click games, all those games are available and um, take a look at them. There's so many awesome games on Music Play Online. Uh, and then there are some theory works, worksheet stations available as well. Um, so there's the Know Your Rhythms book, the Know Your Note Names book, and Know Your Music Terms and Symbols as well. So you could maybe, that would be a good one for if like you have a student who's getting through things really quick uh, and have that additional center where there's something extra for them to do. Okay, so I just listed here the resources that uh, were used today and uh, I'm available for uh, questions if we have any questions today. Stacey, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any questions. Let me just check here. Yeah, you're very thorough and informative. <laughs> uh, we have one question that just came in. Uh, uh -huh. What's the easiest way to have students access the games online? Uh, I think that it, it's a tricky one because everybody's so different at their school of what they have. For me, the easiest way with the littles is using a QR code and having them use their iPad. And I have to teach them how to go into the camera and hold that up to the QR code and then push the link. Um, again, it's tricky because I can't share you with you my specific QR code because it's attached to my Music Play account when I copy and paste the games into those links. Um, and then I just been using, my school has Adobe available and there's a QR code generator in there that I've been, been using to make my QR codes. Uh, for the older students, the easiest way has been going into Google Classroom. 
and I just make myself a teacher in their homeroom teacher's Google Classroom or the teachers add me in and then I'll just post the links into their Google Classroom. Okay. Let's see if you right. can awesome. yeah. yeah, it looks like uh, Brittany uh, has a hand up if you want to unmute and uh, ask your question. That would be great. Hi. Hi. Um, I just was a little bit confused about your, what was it called? The center station cards where you have the kids write down their groups. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Are you having them, are you having them track essentially which ones they get through so that when they come back, they know where to start again? Or I think I just misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. It's a little confusing. Um, so they have to send your card, the group card, and I would hand that to the group and the students all just write their names on there. And then they can come up with a group name as well. Then I take that card and I have the center tracking sheet and I write the group name where they went that day. So if the group decided to call themselves the Treble Clefs and they started at um, the Rhythm Dice Center, I would write Treble Clefs there first and then just keep track of where everybody goes as they move through my room. I like to always keep it in a circle and then they just move from one over to the next, to the next, to the next. And then I keep track of the, the group names um, and then I just have all the names down. And then also if a student uh, wasn't there that day, I can quickly add them into another group um, or if somebody shows up late too, it's really handy. It sounds a little bit confusing, but it does keep things organized and keeps my keeps me sane <laughs> when I'm teaching that many groups. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Okay. All right, great. Um, do you have any suggestions for students with ASD um, and other special needs, for example, that like to touch instruments around the room? Oh, wait, yes, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I'm, our school, we have a very, very, very wide range of needs in the classroom. Um, so really, you got to figure out the kid and work with what you have what you have um, available. Like for this week, for example, one thing that worked with my one of my students with ASD was saying, okay, can you try today staying in the room for 10 minutes? And if you stay in the room for 10 minutes, you can pick out one of the instruments and take it out into the hallway for another 10 minutes. That worked this week. Um, that might not work next week. <laughs> uh, so when you're doing centers, it's a little tricky because it does get noisy. Um, and so I would try and keep myself a little bit more available for that student. I would make sure that it doesn't get too loud in the classroom as well. And um, yeah, it's a, that's a tough one because uh, we, there, every every student with ASD is so different and you have to figure out what works for each of those individual students. Um, and then again, too, just having routine and structure is really, really important for those kiddos. Um, and then uh, pairing them as well. If there's a student that they do work well with, try putting them in that group um, and just seeing if they can, yeah, handle one or two centers that day, and then they can have a choice activity after. Um, I hope that's helpful. But yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm learning every day about what works for the different students in my classroom. Um, somebody says, I've never done centers before, but I would love to introduce them to my class. Where do I start in terms of getting them started? Uh, I would start first with some games and just some collaborative activities before you try um, a whole bunch of different centers. So just pick one that would be um, easy to do as a whole class game first and get a collection of those. And then when you have enough where the kids can play those things pretty independently, then spread them out and add some additional centers in. That's how I would start if you're new to it. And I'm just finding too, lately with um, a lot of our students, they have a hard time working together. And I've had to really explicitly teach how to work in groups, how to take turns, um, and do a lot of practice with that as well. And I know the classroom teachers are as well. Um, there's That's just been lacking the last few years. So um, it's really good practice for them to, to just play a game and work together and then spread it out into centers after. All right, excellent. Uh, would you recommend projecting a timer during centers or just surprise students with a signal when it's time to switch instead? I've done both. <laughs> it sometimes depends on the group. Um, 
some groups are okay with me just kind of saying, okay, we can move on to the next center. But I have projected a timer before too and been like, oh, we're doing seven minutes here. Uh, yeah, it really, for me, it's dependent on what my students are like at that time and what they can handle. And for some, they like that visual of being able to see the timer. All right, excellent. Um, how do you assess them with the centers? Uh, do you walk around with a grading book or do something else? Um, I what I would do again too, and I said kind of in the presentation is just pick one center to do an assessment with, so that they're the other groups are just doing things independently. And uh, for me, I keep my iPad with me because I do everything on PowerSchool. So if I could just quickly jot something off in my iPad and set up the assignment ahead of time of what I'm going to go through um, and then just mark that down. Other times I've just done a whole bunch of sticky notes and just jot it down as quick as I can or have class lists and jot down notes as I go. Um, and especially too, if they're doing like the whiteboard things, you, you need to see it before they erase it. So I've also taken pictures, make them write their name on the top and take a picture of it. And then I have it um, to look at after if I need to. Uh, also, a great thing for assessment is video, if you can take videos of them as well. All right, excellent. Um, how do the students know if they're doing things correctly? For example, when they are practicing rhythm? Yes, so um, in some of them, there's some self-correction. Uh, but like for the busted games, uh, no, there's not a self-correcting. But what I find is I just kind of walk around the room and kids will ask questions too. Like they'll be like, Miss Warner, I don't know what this one is. and I'll show them again. And then they work together as a group to continue reviewing that. Um, so sometimes I feel like they don't need to have all the answers right there in front of them. And it's good to just practice and look. And if they have those questions, they can ask those questions. And the students in the group as well, if there's one student who does know, they can help um, as well. So uh, yeah, so for centers like Busted, where there isn't that self-check piece, uh, just playing it over and over again and giving them more opportunities for that exposure. Uh, is good for them too. Somebody asks, the empty station for students who finish early, is mm -hmm. that what you me meant to be for open for students that need a bit more of a challenge? If they are grouped, wouldn't the whole group need to rotate to the empty? The only center I've found where sometimes kids finish a little bit early is the coloring one. Sometimes some kids get that one done real quick um, and other kids take a really long time. Some of the other ones, they continue playing all the way through. So like Busted, they would just continue to play. In the games, they would just continue to play. Um, and so to be honest, I haven't used that extra. I put that in as a suggestion, but I haven't had to use that very often because um, most of the time, like they're they're finishing up and uh, if they have time, they can play the game again. If they have time, they can do a second uh, example on the whiteboard if they have, if they have that opportunity. Um, and when we're only doing like five to seven minutes for some kids, the coloring center, I'll just say, oh, you can take your sheet home with you today as well if you wanna continue working on it at home. Uh, yeah, so that's a tricky one um, as well, but yeah, I honestly, I haven't had to use it that often. Usually the centers keep them busy through the full time period. All right, awesome. And it actually looks like we have someone with a hand up. Uh, Lorraine, if you wanted to unmute, ask your question. Yeah, yeah. hi, thank you very much. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to know if if there is a way for the uh, the clap and clap and say or snap and say, um, if I could uh, translate it because the my I teach in English, but my colleagues it's it's all in French. So like okay. instead of Jack, like Canard, is there a way that or should I just sort of print my own word and then like laminate it underneath? Yeah, I I apologize. I I don't speak French, so <laughs> no, no, no. no just, if there you're welcome that, to do that if you if you want to. Yeah, go okay. for it. Yeah, okay. yeah. but there's for no sure. way that I could edit the actual. Yeah, no, there's no way to edit the actual PDFs. Yeah. Um, okay, that yeah. makes sense. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. No worries. Okay. All right, I've got a couple more questions for you. Okay. Uh, do you ever do centers where you're teaching a small group of students a new skill, for example, a five to or 10 to 15 minute lesson with a ukulele and another group on technology and or playing a game independently? Uh, yes, I have done that with my older students with ukulele and with recorder um, and just set up some different stations for them. And we might just be working on, or maybe I just need to work specifically with a certain group um, who needs to get caught up on ukulele or recorder uh, and just giving them that opportunity to have a little bit of more close attention with me. 
Um, so yeah, I have done that before and it, and it is effective. Just got to make sure that the games are very, what you're doing in the other stations, the students are very independent and um, like the the teachers do this uh, in our school, like with using the daily five, like they read with a small group and then have the rest of the class doing things independently. Um, so using that approach as well in the music room is a great, great idea. All right, awesome. Um, how often do you do centers? Um, yes, yeah, so no, this is a great question. I personally, I love to do them towards a break. So like right before Christmas break and right towards the end of the year to keep the kids busy because it's something different than showing them a movie at the end of the school year. Um, and it keeps them busy right till the end. Uh, and then I've also used it when I'm doing recorder and when I'm doing ukulele to, to give that opportunity to work on individualized skills or catch some students up as well. Um, yeah, so, and the group collaborative activities we do throughout the year. All right, perfect. And I have a question that kind of connects nicely from another uh, person. So mm -hmm. the first part of their question is, when do you do centers exactly, which you kind of talked, touched on, um, mm -hmm. and would you leave them with a sub? Uh, I would leave, like rhythm dice, I leave with a sub often. I have a whole bunch of kits made up. In fact, I'm leaving them for my sub tomorrow. Uh, so, but I, I don't know if I would do all six different centers for a sub. That's a lot. And that's a lot of explanation, but if there's one that the students have done in a game and you have enough for the whole class to do that game, it's a great center. And it's a great thing for just some review while you're, while you're away. Well, thanks so much for having me. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much again for being here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. If you would like to earn a PD certificate for this episode, download the accompanying handout or watch the webinar, please go to workshops.musicplay.ca. See you next time. It's time for Music Play.